I'm honored to present your president, David L. Bartlett, today. David was born in Michigan in 1961 and then moved to Southern California. Here you see Dave as a toddler, and here he is wearing a stylish suit with a bow tie. His dad was an aerospace engineer, and they then moved to Los Alamos, New Mexico. This shows Dave in elementary school, wearing a stylish striped shirt, and here he is playing baseball. Now his mother was a homemaker, and she had a profound influence on David in that she developed leukemia and this spurred his interest in oncology. Dave has a sister, Julie, and a brother, Rich. This is Dave's graduation picture from high school. And here you can see the long hair and characteristic bulky knot that were popular in the 1970s. He then went to Rice University. And after Rice University, he went to UT Health Science Center in Houston, where he graduated AOA and at that time, he worked under Michael Keating from MD Anderson, where he worked on reviewing charts of patients who died of leukemia and found that fungal infections were very common. Dave's work led to institution of prophylaxis against fungus infections in leukemia patients. He then, for surgical residency, went to the University of Pennsylvania, the oldest hospital and medical school in the country. This shows Jonathan Rhodes and I.S. Rabden, but more important was John Daly to, to David. He was both a clinical and basic science mentor. Perhaps more important than even this was that David met his future wife, Susan, in his first week at University of Pennsylvania, and they were married almost 30 years ago. He decided to do his fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and this shows the class of 1995 with a decidedly young looking Dr. Brennan and Dr. Coit, but an even younger looking Dave Bartlett who looks like he's about 14 years of age. This shows his other fellows, Jeff Cavolius, the chief fellow, Carol Swallow, Tracy Weigel, Boris Kushinoff, and Elliot Newman. And I'm not sure who this guy is who snuck in the back. Now, his first job after fellowship in 1996 was at the NIH, and this was a great place under the leadership of Steven Rosenberg, and also there was Rich Alexander and Doug Fraker, and then Steve Labuti came a little bit later. And here, David was given a laboratory and uh, the ability to work on whatever he wanted, and he decided to develop viral vaccines for treatment of cancer. In 2001, he was lured to the steel city of Pittsburgh, which is the home of Mr. Rogers, with whom Dave sh shares many attributes, as, such as humility, kindness, and caring for his fellow man. At the University of Pittsburgh, he was made head of surgical oncology under Tim Billier, the chairman, and he had the opportunity to train and work with Herb Zay, Clark Gamblin, Melissa Hogue, and H.A. Chowdhury, among others. This shows Dave with Bernie Fisher, for whom he had his chair uh, at the Bernie Fisher Annual Memorial Lecture. Dave's scholarship is impressive. He has 335 peer-reviewed manuscripts, 32 book chapters, one book, 151 invited lectures. He's got an impressive H index of 62. He's had a T32 grant since 2006, and he's had three R01s one R21, and has been co-PI of a program project grant. Here's Dave with Herb Zay back in the days in Pittsburgh. And here's Dave on his morning commute to work. To work. His areas of expertise are many, melanoma and limb perfusion, hepatic perfusion for metastatic tumors, HIPEC, viral therapy for cancer, minimally invasive pancreatectomy with Herb Zay and endocrine surgery. One of his proudest accomplishments is he founded the Regional Cancer Therapy Meeting in 2005, and the University of Pittsburgh ran this meeting until the SSO took it over several years ago. And here's Dave and Susan accepting an award for his contributions to this meeting over these many years. But perhaps more important to Dave even than these things are his family. And here's Dave and Christine on the right and Chad on the left. And here they are, the whole family on a ski vacation. Here's Dave and Susan and Chad and Christine at the beach. Here's Chad and Dave at the beach. And here they are horseback riding in New Mexico. 
here they are at the beach once again, a popular place. This shows Dave sailing with Dan Coit, and I think Dan is rummaging for rum down below because he's a little frightened of Dave's sailing skills. Dave and Susan love to travel, and here's Dave and Susan at the Pyramids of Giza. Here they are in Brazil, at these beautiful waterfalls, and here they are again in the Alps. Here's Dave with Charlie Balch, and I'm not sure what they're wearing on their heads, but they're in Tibet. Well, without further ado, I want to introduce your president, David Bartlett. David, thank you so much for your service to the SSO over this past year and for your contributions to cancer surgery. Dave will be giving a talk entitled Surgical Oncology Moonshot. Thank you, David. Thanks, Jim, for that hopefully kind introduction. My purpose for this talk is to rally the surgical oncology community around moonshot goals that if accomplished will transform what we can do for our patients while preserving the surgical oncologist's role in the multidisciplinary care of patients. As with the mission to reach the moon at a time when the US was lacking in technology and knowledge, everything was transformed with a goal, a competitive spirit and ordinary people working together with a passion for success. So why is it critical to have a moonshot? John F. Kennedy announced the moonshot program at my alma mater, Rice University, and rallied the crowd. But why the moon? Why does Rice play Texas? Not because they're, they are easy, but because the goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. The term moonshot has become synonymous for an ambitious, exploratory, and groundbreaking project undertaken with collaboration creativity, and a mindset for success. And the point was not to gather moon dust. It was far reaching. It was about improving all aspects of technology that was needed to propel the US into the future. But a defined goal and timeline rallied the country, the scientists and the engineers to make so many important advances critical to our future. Ultimately, it may have saved the US from becoming irrelevant on the world stage. In 1957, Sputnik streaked across the sky, the first satellite to orbit the Earth, and it was developed by the Soviet Union. Four years later, the Soviets successfully put the first man in space on Vostok 1. So when Kennedy announced the Moonshot program, we were behind the Russians in technology and space exploration and heading for irrelevance. Kennedy stated, for while we cannot guarantee that we shall one day be first, we can guarantee that any failure to make this effort will make us last. While I would never want to portray that we are in some kind of cold war with the medical oncologists and basic scientists, I would like to use that spirit to awaken the surgical oncologists. We are behind and at risk of being left out. While it is not surprising that the $1.8 billion cancer program was entitled Cancer Moonshot, it's worth asking where do surgery and surgeons fall into this paradigm? While surgery remains the most successful way to cure cancer, surgical science is not represented in any of the funding initiatives and surgical oncology is not even represented in the blue ribbon panel that defines the problems to address. The Cancer Moonshot Task Force was created to include seven working groups specific for the biggest areas of research in oncology, and not one of them addressed issues specific to surgical oncology. There is a gap between the science and clinical care. In the same way that the US was at risk of becoming irrelevant on the world stage if the Moonshot program didn't bring us back, there's risk for the field of surgical oncology if we're not asking the right questions and doing the right trials. I think often about this study I performed when I was a fellow at Memorial, Murray Brennan and Marty Carpe spent many weekends in a dingy basement reviewing paper charts on every patient diagnosed with diffuse large B cell gastric lymphoma over a 10 year period. Those patients treated with surgery alone had a 100% cure rate. Yet when was the last time any surgeon operated on gastric lymphoma for cure? Standard therapy for stage one, two gastric lymphoma is six cycles of our CHOP followed by 3,600 centigrade radiation. This can lead to perforations, bleeding, neutropenia, hair loss, and a very poor quality of life and long-term risks of myelodysplastic syndrome, second malignancies, and not all of these patients are cured. A minimally invasive distal gastrectomy can be extremely well tolerated, but this will never be revisited. Non-operative management can be a goal 
and measure of success for medical and radiation oncologists. Consider the recent description by ASCO of the greatest achievements in oncology for 2019, naming the refinement of surgical treatment of cancer as the advance of the year, recognizing the effectiveness of novel systemic therapies in reducing the amount of surgery and even the need for it. Another example exists with rectal cancer and watch and wait. While we all agree that total neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiation therapy followed by watch and wait for complete clinical responders is a great advance for low bulky rectal cancer patients with significant comorbidities. But what about mid to high rectal cancers with T3N0 disease? In many institutions, those patients are now routinely also treated with total neoadjuvant therapy and watch and wait. We are seeing this ball roll down a hill that is going to be hard to push back up. We should be identifying a cohort of patients that could benefit from neoadjuvant proctectomy with watch and wait for systemic chemotherapy. For some patients, a surgery only approach would be simpler, safer, cheaper, and associated with a better quality of life and long-term survival than the alternative. A similar path may be followed with breast cancer. Systemic chemotherapy and local stereotactic radiosurgery of breast cancers is in trials as an alternative to lumpectomy. Patients should not lose the opportunity to have a safe, curative, non-mutilating surgery for breast cancer. But who except surgeons will study the who, what, when, and how behind this goal? Now, there, one of my faculty members at the University of Pittsburgh said to me, there really isn't anything left to do in surgical oncology research. We have learned to be as radical as possible and as minimalist as possible. The only new advances will be in medical oncology. Trust me, there's always more to do. For instance, I pointed out this article by Ren and Canavero, a neurosurgeon who published the technical details of cephalosomatic anastomosis, head transplant. I can imagine going to sleep with widely metastatic cancer devastating my body and waking up with a brand new one. Of course, there are 600,000 patients dying of cancer in the US and only a fraction of brain dead donors available. So that's right, we had to think of a bridge to transplant. So he's wrong, there's always more to do. The key to success of the Moonshot program was that we had a far reaching but achievable goal. We could imagine being successful. Kennedy did not say in 10 years, let's better understand cold gas thruster technology as it relates to thrust vectoring and the gravitational well. He also didn't say in 10 years, we will have vacation homes in the Andromeda galaxy. The goal was to land on the moon and the technology grew around that. Since I've had a lot of time to think about it, I'll share three goals that I think the society and its members should embrace. Number one, 95% of patients undergoing surgery for primary cancer should be cured. And it's not to say that we should expect that surgery alone will cure every patient. But if, but if we are embarking on surgical treatment, the patient should be cured. We've made the right decision to operate. We've managed perioperative factors that impact cancer recurrence, and we've used the optimal adjuvant to address micrometastatic disease. Arun Chowdhury and I have a database of over 2,000 patients that have been treated with cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC at the University of Pittsburgh by these outstanding surgeons and partners. And Patrick Wagner, using multivariate analysis, developed a nomogram for making decisions that includes these four factors. This is an example of where the majority of surgical prognostication is stuck. Imagine if your financial advisor using a nomogram of four statistically significant predictive factors on multivariate analysis published three years ago from data generated over 10 years prior to advise you on where to invest your money, you might find a new financial advisor. They use machine learning to take into consideration physical factors, psychological factors, rationale and irrational behaviors, day of the week, holidays, time of year, international crises, pandemics, and more to make predictions. Baseball coaches have more information at their fingertips than surgeons on predictive outcomes. You cannot separate radiologic tumor stage from the tumor microenvironment, from the nutritional status of the patient, from the genetic profile of the tumor, from the psychological frailty of the patient, from the time the tumor has had to grow, from the immune microenvironment, the patient's comorbidities, the microbiome, marital status, family support. But using AI to help us assess all of these factors represents our need. 
as surgeons, we have access to all the information at this point, but we need to use machine learning technology and artificial intelligence to analyze it and predict the surgical cure, ideally in real time with real time data obtained directly from electronic medical records. We're working on it. In order to cure cancer with surgery, we need to know whether the tumor has already metastasized at the time of surgery. Right now, in most solid tumors, we rely on radiographic imaging to predict who has metastatic disease. We need, to, we need better predictive biomarkers. The technology is commercially available to examine circulating tumor cells, tumor DNA, microRNA, exosomes, even the T cell repertoire. Yet very few papers in the literature are examining these assays in the perioperative setting to predict recurrence after surgery for cancer. As a society, we must ask ourselves whether the ease of presenting and publishing case series is negatively impacting our field. Young surgeons need to think about practical problems, develop hypotheses, and without being intimidated, utilize the latest technology to solve them. It takes as much time to publish a case series as it does to analyze serum for biomarkers. We simply need to think about practice changing research and ask the right questions. It is clear that perioperative stress and complications impact recurrence, and who but surgeons are going to find the solutions to this problem. This is a patient of mine who had a slow growing rectal recurrence for 14 years that became finally symptomatic. I resected the tumor, but it was complicated by a pelvic infection. A three month postoperative CT scan revealed widespread new lung metastases, and the patient died of metastatic disease nine months after surgery. According to Pittsburghers, Surgery exposes tumors to air, and air makes cancer grow faster. And their observation may be right. Deleterious effects of surgery include the initiation of local and or systemic inflammation, increased catecholamine levels, immunosuppression, a prothrombotic state, release of nets and damps. Cancer cells that escape resection are subject to these perioperative and physiological changes and might disseminate and colonize distant organs, thus contributing to postoperative cancer recurrence. We had Lorenzo Ferry discuss his research into neutrophil extracellular traps at the SSO a couple of years ago. Now, and Sung and Samer Tomei at the University of Pittsburgh discovered high levels of nets in HMGV1 in a model of liver cancer after surgery, and that inhibiting that activity using DNAs can improve cancer related survival. So, if we identify patients who are going to recur after surgery, then let's design post operative adjuvant trials that can impact recurrence. Adaptive designs can minimize the number of patients needed and answer questions quickly. Nobody has done this better than Laura Esserman and the ISPY trials for breast cancer. The adaptive design is a unique protocol where five new drugs are examined simultaneously, added to standard regimens and neoadjuvant, randomized trials for patients with locally advanced breast cancers using complete pathologic response as the endpoint. Known and exploratory biomarkers are used to stratify and direct accrual. They have explored 16 different new agents in the neoadjuvant setting in breast cancer since 2010, and three new drugs have received accelerated approval through that process. So getting to 95% cure means we have to address a lot of things. Better prognostication through systems biology and machine learning, improved biomarkers and examination of the tumor microenvironment, addressing perioperative factors and improving adjuvant therapy. All together, as we accomplish this goal, we will advance a lot of important technology for surgeons. Second goal is to minimize the impact of cancer surgery such that no oncologic operation is longer than a 48 hour hospital stay. It may seem ridiculous or unnecessary, but we take for granted that cholecystectomies are same day surgeries. When I started my training, cholecystectomy resulted in a seven day hospital stay with a month off work, wound complications, drains, major quality of life impact. If we as surgeons had not improved the impact of our, surgeons, or of our surgery, we would no longer even see these patients. All of these patients would have managed with a percutaneous drain, antibiotics, gastroenterologists would have figured out a way to take the gallbladder out without our help, and we would not see these patients. Hip replacement surgery is a same day surgery. You can have your aortic valve replaced and be home in two days. Patients with gastric bypass surgery and two anastomoses, morbid obesity, go home with tw within 24 hours with less than 1% mortality. In general, surgical oncology has been behind the curve when it comes to optimizing surgical technique and perioperative management. But I think that's a mistake. Suzanne Klimberg, Charles Scoggins, and I started the Fellows Institute 
to show the next generation of surgical oncologists that the SSO embraces technology. And I became interested in robotics after visiting Dr. Bagazi at the City of Hope and participating in a minimally invasive surgical oncology conference in 2007. The robotic technology highlighted had significant advantage, advantages over straight laparoscopy for intracorporeal suturing. Soon thereafter, Sri Chalakanda and I visited Pierre Giulianotti to watch his technique for robotic whipples at the University of Illinois. And within a few weeks, Herb Zay, Sri and I performed the first robotic whipple at the University of Pittsburgh. Herb Zay and Jim Moser then developed the robotic whipple technique that worked for them and rigorously studied the technique without the bias that it was better than standard. This video is showing you a complex uh, resection for a vein involved pancreatic cancer with a replaced right hepatic artery from Dr. Zurichat. And at Pitt, uh, Dr. Zurichat reported on our first 500 Whipples, and now he tells me there are over 700 and over 1,200 pancreatectomies. And thanks to Melissa Hogue, who developed a robust training program, they have trained 25 fellows and two numerous to count attendings across the world in this technique. So how close are we to a 48-hour stay after Whipple? Patients are treated with minimally invasive Whipples, an ERAS protocol for perioperative management. The drains are removed on post-op day two, and the patients can be discharged on post-op day four. Clearly, the 48-hour stay after complex surgical oncology, oncology cases is not just about the robotic approach. It's about patient education, prehab, perioperative care, ERAS, home care, pain control, avoiding unnecessary tubes and drains. All that we will learn in accomplishing this goal will apply to other complex surgical oncology procedures. This will improve the acceptance of surgery, improve the cancer-related outcome, and improve the ability to use surgery as part of a multidisciplinary program where patients can get on to their adjuvant therapy without it being too debilitating. The final moonshot goal is that no patient should die of peritoneal or liver metastases. We need to continue to explore innovative ways to use surgical techniques to treat regionally advanced cancers other than resection alone. This is what I've dedicated much of my clinical career to, focused on using surgery to deliver biologic agents and chemotherapy to regions of the body for cancers that are beyond standard resection options, yet still regionally confined. This program was started at the National Cancer Institute by Doug Fraker and Rich Alexander, and taken up by myself and Steve Labuti and included regional perfusions for the limb, the liver, the peritoneum, the pleura, and the lung, and I think even the kidney at one point. This is still a unique avenue of research for surgical oncologists to expand our tools in a way to help cancer patients. My goal when I left the NCI was to prove that these programs could be developed outside the walls of the NIH Clinical Center and to develop this as a field of collaborative research in centers across the U.S. I think we've been successful. The majority of academic surgical oncology divisions have programs in regional therapy, mostly centered around peritoneal metastases, all credit given to Sh Paul Sugarbaker for this field. Rich Alexander, Clark Gamblin, and I started the Regional Therapies Conference for the sharing of research around regional therapies. And this grew from a handful of surgeons presenting their research in a small room in Pittsburgh to a strong group of over 200 surgeons and over 100 abstracts this year in Orlando. The SSO has taken this on and it has been renamed Advanced Cancer Therapies, demonstrating the commitment to education and research around advanced surgical therapies that extends the use of surgical techniques for advanced cancers. The goal is to share ideas and data that expand the role of surgery beyond classically resectable tumors. I look forward to the SSO continuing to develop this opportunity to address this essential need of our field and encourage the consideration of additional similar conferences to focus on minimal impact surgery and to focus on biomarkers and perioperative interventions. My laboratory has been dedicated to exploring regional immunotherapy using tumor-selective oncolytic vaccinivirus, expressing novel immunogens. And I'm looking forward to moving forward with the clinical trial of intraperitoneal oncolytic vaccinia virus expressing a redesigned IL-2. I know trials of intraperitoneal and intrahepatic heart T cells and novel nanoparticles for sustained intraperitoneal drug release are being explore, explored. Imagine the right clinical trial network with the right design and endpoint that would allow a series of trials like the iSpy, where we could know what combination of new drugs would solve unresectable liver metastases or peritoneal metastases. Charles Staley is trying to make this happen through ECOG and deserves our support. Surgeons used to lead the charge. 
I had the honor of working with Bernie Fisher over the last 20 years at the University of Pittsburgh. Bernie passed away this year at the age of 101 after a 75 year career leading oncology research. At the same time that Sputnik was flying in 1957, he was helping to establish the NSABP at the direction of I.S. Rabden, Chair of Surgery at the University of Pennsylvania. He had the determination and fortitude to rally the surgical oncology community around enrolling patients on randomized clinical trials to test hypotheses regarding the biology of cancer. This included all surgeons, academic and community. He was responsible for defining the paradigm of how cancers metastasized and transforming the way the world thought about and treated cancer. He was the world leader in clinical oncology research. And others have led clinical oncology research. Steve Rosenberg, Murray Brennan, Charles Balch, Don Morton, Armando Giuliano, Norm Walmark, Sam Wells, Heidi Nelson, Monica Bertignoli, Suzanne Tapelli and Kelly McMasters, Ron DiMatteo, Laura Esserman, Monica Morrow, all have run pivotal trials and I've left out many. Amongst these idols are chairs of surgery, presidents of the SSO, ASCO, ACS, Lasker Award winner, winners, Nobel candidates, and just to be clear, those accolades and titles came after they pu published their clinical trials. So the road to academic success and career fulfillment is through a randomized clinical trial, a simple formula. So why has the culture changed and what can we do about it? Is it because we are lost and intimidated when it comes to the enormous te technical advances in research tools? Is it because of bias against surgeons for research funding? Is it because we are beholden to RVU counters and cannot find the time? And the answer is yes to all. We lack knowledge, we lack money, and we lack time. But all that can be overcome if we have passion and a goal. Howard Thurman, an author and philosopher, once said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go and do that because what the world needs is people who have come alive. And I hope that you can be passionate around these goals or other moonshot goals that society puts forth. With passion, we will understand how transcriptomics and artificial intelligence can tell us which patients to operate on. With vision, we will find funding through grateful patients uh, and industry and hospital support and the NIH. And with fortitude, we will spend the extra hour or two a day after long operations to make pro pro progress. We need to work as a coordinated team and the SSO should help organize that team. The real moonshot required practical solutions to the goal of putting a person on the moon. It was in no way ignorant to new technology and the understanding of new physics, but imagine if Kennedy put the physicists in charge of putting a man on the moon. My father was a mechanical engineer working in the aerospace industry and he used to describe to me the difference between physicists and engineers. Physicists study the world as it is, Engineers create the world that has never been. You can create a world that has never been. And I'll leave you with this allegory. 2000 years BC, King Midas tied an ox cart to a post with a number of intricate knots. And believe it or not, that knot sur survived for 1700 years, at which point an oracle decreed that anyone that can untie the knot would be the ruler of all Asia. As you might imagine, molecular biologists, physicists, genomics experts, immunologists, all studied the complex knot microenvironment for 100 years, leading to numerous oral abstract presentations, high impact manuscripts, grants, tenure appointments, endowed professorships, and research awards, but the cart didn't move. Then came along Alexander the Great, who pulled out his scalp scalpel or sword, depending on how you look at it, and slice the knot in half, allowing it to unravel. Surgeons have an essential role in cancer treatment and research, and we cannot let that slip away. While I'm a supporter of the academic surgery model, this surgical oncology moonshot is not only the realm of traditional academic institutions. I've taken on the exciting role of building the most productive translational research platform in the country as the Cancer Institute Chair at Allegheny Health Network in Pittsburgh. We will be studying practical solutions to the biggest problems in cancer care while leveraging the IDFS model, corporate engagement, entrepreneurism, philanthropy, and collaboration with forward-thinking companies and institutions. 
After all, Apple, Google, and Amazon have transformed the world in goal-oriented ways that cannot have been predicted by traditional academic institutions. All SSO members should participate in this surgical oncology moonshot and set the bar high. Change the culture from surgeons being at the bottom of the research hierarchy to the top, solving difficult problems in practical ways. It has been an honor serving as your president this year, and I need to thank the other leaders that I've worked closely with, the executive committee and the executive council and the hundreds of volunteers that really make this organization hum. And especially Armando Giuliano and Jim Howe, who I've worked so clo closely with over the last many years. And I especially want to thank the entire staff of the SSO and Eileen Widmer. I am convinced that we have the best staff of any medical organization and it's all I could do to keep up with them. I am thankful for my mentors, John Daly, Murray Brennan, Steve Rosenberg, Dan Coit, Rich Alexander, Charles Balch, Tim Billier, Mike Lotz, Bernie Fisher, and many others, and I always strive, strive to pass that forward. And I'm in debt to those that have intentionally or surreptitiously helped my career, Jeff Drevin, Mitch Posner, Jim Economo, Suzanne Klimberg, Jim Lukatich, Marty Heslin and Mike Chin. I've been fortunate to have had outstanding partners uh, at the NCI and Pat Pitt. And I'd especially like to recognize Herb Zay, who joined me at Pitt at the beginning with a similar work ethic and passion for building a program and a partner and friend, confidant and colleague for 17 years. Now, I'm indebted to my loyal staff, Heather, Michelle, Margaret, Maureen, and Sue, and so many others that have been with me through the years. And most proud of the over 80 trainees that I've had the privilege of working with. This meeting was a celebration for them, and I only wish we could have done it in person. Finally, I would like to thank my family. My kids, Chrissy and Chad, grew up never having had breakfast, lunch, or dinner with me on a weekday. Think about what that means. Aside from not being responsible for their table manners, it's a small example of how I was not around enough to raise them. I was not around enough to celebrate important events in their lives. I was not around enough to help them through difficult times. I was not around enough. Yet thanks to Susan, also known as single mother in my neighborhood, they turned out great and I'm so proud of who they are. What I did manage to have enough time for was to play with them, which was way more fun for me than for them. And I cherish and continue to treasure that more than they will ever comprehend. And they have great significant others, Jack Parker and Julia Bazone. And Susan, in addition to being an exceptional nurse practitioner in our surgical oncology practice and a true partner on our team, she has been as devoted to my career as I am. It is humbling and something I can never pay back. As I get older, I realize that the most important thing we can accomplish on this earth is a lasting, loving relationship. And if that were as easy as walking on the moon, the world would, have, would be a utopian dream. But somehow Susan and I have that for 30 years and counting, and I've succeeded therefore in my moonshot. I'm lucky and I thank her. <laughs>